I will come back to the story of, of antibiotics and I will give you a little overview on a, a underestimated group of microorganisms using as producers of uh, antibiotics, the myxobacteria. And as you heard, uh, antibiotics are produced by microorganisms. They are not produced to uh, help the human beings. They are produced to help themselves. That is a long period uh, of millions of years where microorganisms are living together without humans. They are not so interested in ourselves. And they need compounds to communicate, to, to stimulate, and to uh, induce their processes, uh, the social processes we, for example, find in myxobacteria when they uh, form their swarms and fruit bodies. And so maybe we have also to have a different look on secondary metabolites and their need in nature. So I will give you a short overview on the Helmholtz Center of Infection Strain Collection show you what are myxobacteria and the secondary metabolites in, in some examples. So Helmholtz Center for Infection Research is located in Braunschweig and this year we have our 50 years anniversary. There are about 820 employees from 40 different countries, around 100 guests, uh, scientists on an area uh, you can see here. And this is the oldest building, and the strain collection is placed in right here. So it's very important for us to work together in a, a collaboration at the Helmholtz uh, Society. And, and so we are closely related to some other groups. I've painted here the strain collection in the middle of the other different groups working with natural products and secondary metabolites. It's the group of uh, Professor Rolf Müller in Saarbrücken at the Minz, uh, where he is working with uh, myxobacterial genetics, metabolome mining, mode of action, and uh, the special databases. Also in Saarbrücken Place is a group of Andrei Luschetsky working with the genetics and molecular biology of actinomycetes, secondary metabolites, and placed in Braunschweig together with us is the department of Mark Stadler. He is responsible for large-scale production, fermentation for natural product, chemistry, and also strain improvement. If you look to our strain collection with about 9,000 isolates of myxobacteria, I think it's the hugest collection of myxobacteria worldwide. But historically, uh, we have some focus on different groups of the Syrangium, Corallococcus, Myxococcus, or, and uh, Nanocystis are the main or the hugest number of strains we have within the collection. And today we have a focus on the isolating of uh, novel myxobacteria, especially from these groups where we do not have so many isolates. And I want to announce a talk of Katrin Mohr on the uh, last day when she is uh, of this uh, Congress, she will give you an introduction how we are, how we can find novel isolates in this field. And to show you a little overview of our process, it's done here in the next slides. We start with a strain from our uh, culture collection, makes a recultivation in shaking flasks, produce an extract, and from this extract, we uh, check the biological activity against the number of gram-positive, gram-negative strains and also some fungi. Then we make the analysis uh, of the UV and mass spectra of the compounds we found within these extracts and look in a database if such a compound should be known or should be a novel one. And this uh, is the most important point to find out if the compound is known or novel. And this we do with a combination of uh, microbiological fractionation. You can see here in this uh, micro titter plate, you see here is the active spots. You have fractionated our extract, uh, and all these fractions are shown in this micro titter plate. You can see in this fraction and this one 
uh, good activity. This is uh, the whole uh, extract and this is the reference. And you can see here, these are correlating to very small peaks. To time is over where we find activities in the huge peaks. We have to look for the smaller ones. And we have here then the information of UV and mass. And, and now know that these compounds are analogs to uh, compounds we, we found earlier. But when we detect an, a new it's a compound, we have to start this long way from the replication to a pure compound that is shown here. We have to start with a strain improvement, which can be done in shaking flasks or some kind of micro plates. We have to develop the analytics and optimize the fermentation process also in shaking flask fermenters and make the upscale. We have to develop the downstream process, uh, how to isolate the compound, and then we have to deferment it in a larger scale and isolate. And if we are successful, we will come up to a pure compound in the end. And uh, one of our main goals is not to find new uh, microorganisms, new species, new genera of myxobacteria, because we so uh, have the experience that we then often find also new groups of secondary metabolites, as is shown here in the new genus Heterobacter. We found these uh, groups, Heteromids, which are uh, potent HIV inhibitors and are in development. So what are myxobacteria? Myxobacteria are gram-negative bacteria. They belong to the delta proteobacteria. They are gliding microorganisms without flagella, and they travel in swarms. They live together. They do not like to live alone. They are rod-shaped and live predominantly in soil. They are predators, and in some cases, random cellulosum, uh, cellulose decomposers. They have, and I will show you this later, very large genomes with up to 30 million nucleotides and are very good producers of biomedical and industrial useful chemicals such as antibiotics and anti-tumor compounds. And most of this uh, chemicals are produced and transported outside the cell. So this is an overview of the systematics of myxobacteria uh, from the end of the uh, last year. We have the groups of myxococcalus. We have the sub or three suborders. In, in total, we have actually about 55, 56 validly published uh, species of myxobacteria. So still today, it's a group of microorganisms which you can have in taxonomy a good overlook, much better than if you work with actinomycetes. On the other hand, only a very small number of groups worldwide is working with these uh, microorganisms because they uh, grow very slow and uh, are often not so easy to handle. But uh, during the last years, we have developed a number of methods to isolate and cultivate myxobacteria nearly in the same way like you can do with actinomycetes. And so I will come to the last uh, point, the secondary metabolites. I will show you in some examples. So you have seen this uh, slide where we are. Uh, myxobacteria uh, here, this is until now, this very small group of secondary metabolite uh, producers that is not uh, basing on the, the small number of metabolites that really produce, it's basing on the small number of groups which until today work with this organism. Because if you look to the genome, you will be surprised about the size, the size of the Rangium cellulosum. Genome is shown here. We have, as I told you, about uh, 30 millions of uh, base pairs. So they belong to the hugest genomes we find in uh, microbiology. And there are many genes which are responsible for a secondary metabolite uh, biosynthesis. And so it's not wondering if you look to the secondary metabolites which have been described over the years from uh, 
our group from Serangium cellulosum. Um, you can see here many, many different secondary metabolites which are produced by this single species. And to show you some uh, important examples, so here is Zorangicin. Zorangicin is, a, let's say, very old antibacterial compound. It's uh, active against gram-positive. It's an RNA polymerase inhibitor and inhibition of the initiation of the uh, peptide chain, which has uh, merely the same binding site like uh, rifampicin. And uh, you can see here today we are on the levels that we can uh, or have worked out a biosynthetic model basing on the retrobiosynthesis. Next is zorafane. Zorafane is an inhibitor of the fungal lipid uh, synthesis from uh, acetyl-CoA to melanyl-CoA. It's inhibiting here. And it can be used especially against Botrytis uh, cinerea. Here you can see it's in, in a uh, wine protection, uh, wine plant, and in the protection you can see here. Zorafane also was found in the 1990s uh, by our group. The biosynthesis of uh, zorafane is a typical PKS biosynthesis. You have this number of uh, different modules which are responsible for the strain. Uh, for, for the chain elongation step by step until you come to this linear molecule which is then closed or cyclicized to the ring. But you can also find some side products when you make point, point mutations, for example, in the SORB gene. With this example, I will leave the uh, antibacterials, antifungals, and antibiotics area and come to uh, two examples of anti-tumor compounds from myxobacteria. The first is tubulysin. Tubulysin is a cytotoxic peptide with antimitotic activity that induces the depletion of cell microtubes and triggers the apoptotic uh, and processes antifungals. So it was published in 2000. And you can see the activity here in these two uh, slides. So also from tubulase and the biosynthesis, this have been uh, cleared. And this is not a PKS. It's an NRPS biosynthesis, um, as you can see here. Again, we have some kind of uh, models which are uh, responsible for this chain elongation step by step. And the last example I want to show you is Epocylon. Epocylon is, I think, the most popular or most known compound from myxobacteria because it's the first and only uh, metabolite on market from uh, myxobacteria. Its activity is antifungal and cytotoxic and has been published in 1996. And it's uh, responsible for induction of tubulin polymerization and apoptosis, and you can see here, this is more or less destroyed, the so cells, and, and then you can see here the uh, <coughs> activity. Epotilone biosynthesis has also been uh, proved, in, and we also found here a PKS, P in the linear, uh, and uh, in the myxobacteria you find many metabolites which are produced by PKS and NRPS biosynthesis. So all this work is only possible within the field of uh, many cooperation partners. And in acknowledgement, I want to show you a number of them, uh, especially in, in Germany. We have together cooperation with the German Culture Collection, which is at the same campus. We work together with a number of different universities and also have a number of cooperation partners worldwide, only to show you here some examples from Iran, India, and Slovakia. And at the end, I have to thank all my collaboration partners at the HIPS and at the HZI. It is a group of Rolf Müller and 
of Andrew Luschetsky in Saarbrücken, the Department of Mark Stadler in Braunschweig, and especially the people of my group. And I thank you very much for your attention. So I think we have some time for, for questions. Yes, please. This collection is, is, has been started uh, in the 1970s of the last uh, century and is uh, from worldwide collected soil samples. Yes, please. So as I told you, the secondary metabolites in uh, myxobacteria are uh, not in the cells. They are uh, exported out of the cells. So what we are uh, using as a first step is we make a cultivation together with XID as an adsorbent uh, in the fermentation broth. So then the metabolites are binding to the XID. So harvesting, that means that we have to separate XID and, and culture uh, broth and, and then we uh, have to extract uh, mainly with methanol or with acetone from this uh, XAD, and then uh, will come some uh, different, depending on, on the compound uh, columns. So. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I So you mean for the screening, the screening culture itself, screens culture itself is in a shaking flask. So we, we have started also some programs, for example, you can see in, uh, if you uh, collect uh, the fruit bodies of myxobacteria, they have a totally different secondary metabolic pattern like you find in liquid culture. Yeah. So uh, up to now we have produced most of our extracts with liquid culture. Uh, you mean in the test? Yes. Yeah, in, in the test, we, we normally use uh, liquid culture. We have it in a micro titter plate. Yeah, you can see it depends on the medium, for example. You can have, for example, if you have a medium containing calcium, for example. Uh, calcium is very important if you have uh, uh, this is, uh, lipopeptides. They are only active if you have a calcium containing medium. You can trigger uh, this uh, biological activity you see in the test later on by use of uh, liquid culture and uh, by or, or uh, plate and by the medium you use that is right okay, the, the is yeah that is, is also there are some compounds which are produced in both but in most cases you you find different patterns of secondary metabolite if you have an ega plate and extract or you have a liquid culture. That's totally different. If, if you look for a myxococcus, for example, myxococcus are very fast growing organisms. You have a culture uh, starting with two to four days uh, up to, to have the, the optimum. If you work with, with syringium or Bisovorax or something like this, you can come up to two weeks or three weeks of fermentation. And what genetic markers do you use for this economy? Please? I mean, the genetic markers, uh, which one do you look for, for the identification? Like, uh, do you identify it by the genes rather than the mean, or what some, with some other genes? For taxonomy, or taxonomy. for taxonomy, you can use 16S. Uh, so it is still an accepted marker, but be careful by using it uh, because uh, the, um, you have up to 99.9 .9, uh, similarity uh, within uh, one genus. So you find very uh, uh, high correlations within in the 
16S in, in different species. So it's uh, very similar like you find it in actinomycetes. So until now, 16S is a uh, uh, well-accepted marker, but uh, in my opinion, be careful by using it, and we are working on development and of different uh, new markers. Yes, please? Until now, we only found them uh, uh, on the chromosome, so the secondary metabolite class. We have only, uh, there is one example uh, that someone seems to have it on a plasmid. So plasmids uh, you, you very seldomly find in, in myxobacteria. With, with every strain, we make a test of if we find a plasmid within, and since I work with, with myxobacteria, we never found one. So the so plasmids are very, very seldom in, in uh, myxobacteria. And it's uh, not, not so easy to uh, transfer the complete uh, gene cluster and express it in, in others and in myxobacteria. So the most success we have is to transfer it for a slow-growing myxobacteria in a fast-growing myxobacteria, in a myxococcus, for example, and to express it there. But they are all on a chromosome coded. So... There's time for one more question, if, yeah. yes, please. Thank you very much for a very exciting presentation. But I want to know the kidneys or the metabolism at the end of that sensitivity test. So the organisms we are... How old were your postdocs? So, so we are using for, for extract production, or... You mean this was the time we use for cultivation of our strains? Of testing the organisms. You tested the organisms we against the uh, extract of antibiotics. Yes. Yes. What were the ages? How old were the cells? So, so, so from the test strain or of the producing strain? The test strains are freshly grown uh, overnight cultures, and the uh, producing strains, the myxobacteria, we, we normally use them um, seven to ten days old cultures. Seven to ten days, days. old cultures. Yes, but in, it depends on the growth. If we have a poor growing or slow growing strain, we also make a culture two weeks, three weeks, four weeks before we make an extract. We have to decide strain by strain. That's a problem of myxobacteria. You cannot use them in a, a large-scale um, industrial screening because you have to check each strain and decide strain by strain which day you will take for harvesting and extract production. If you take one day, let's say seven days, for all myxobacteria, you will lose more than 75% uh, of the secondary metabolites. You have to decide by each strain. I say, yes, yes uh, uh, that is, is um, if we are working with, with, as I told you, with XID. So normally you, you have, uh, you are right, you have often uh, a good production in younger cells, and if you work with older cells, mm -hmm. they uh, also make some kind of disruption of uh, uh, the produced compounds. So we have XID within the culture, so the compounds which are produced by fresh cells binding to XID. And so they are saved for the old fermentation. We can collect all secondary metabolites which are produced over this long period of uh, cultivation. If they are produced in the early beginning or in the later. We have saved them into, by binding on, on the XID. Okay, so thank you very much again for this very fruitful discussion.